we're finally at the meat of the whole project. Let's do a demo. We have the first component deployed to production working to spec. And that is this profile scraper right here. It goes to my profile and scrapes all these videos and then puts them into Airtable. I'm gonna demo it right now. We're gonna invoke the beginning of the pipeline on production and it has to be production because demoing on local is for juniors. We're then gonna see this sheet get filled up with all my videos and then the download URL is going to slowly get filled. Let's go. It's running. Let's go over here. This thing is going to get filled soon. Oh, okay, there we go. So we got filled. And then slowly you see over here, this download URL is gonna slowly start getting filled. Look at that. Download URLs got filled. Let's go into one of these videos. You're trying to... All right, so you can see there are no watermarks anywhere. Boom, boom. Go around as a two minute video. I don't see no watermarks anywhere. Sick. We were able to scrape all our TikTok videos and the no watermark URLs. In this demo, we're gonna take the caption that we scraped here and then we're gonna generate a sanitized title, description, and tags. Then we're gonna upload it to YouTube and get the YouTube URL here. Once again, demoing directly on production, I have one record set to ready. Cause even when you're doing crazy things, you can't be reckless. Let's go. And it's good. Nice. We got our title, our description, our tags, and the YouTube URL. If we go down over here, do a refresh. We got the video. Wait, did we? Nice. See? This one right here, we got, you know, just a hard-coded description. And then probably some tags down over here. Go back up to here, click this URL. Um, Let me explain to you how in nice videos there. Today, it's no longer on Airtable and it's actually designed properly. So if you want to automate your TikTok videos to other platforms, go on over to creatorsimple.com. It'll really help me out if you tested it and told your friends all about it. If you go over to creatorsimple.com, you get a nice landing page over here. Very simple, tells you how to automate, some features, pricing, all the good stuff. Currently, it only supports TikTok to YouTube. I'm planning to do a lot more larger platforms in the future. It's gonna take some time, but you know, I'll get it done. If you click start automating now, you get yourself into a nice little dashboard over here. I'm already logged in. I have 501 videos that have been scraped from my TikTok account. Over here, I have six videos videos approved. The platform currently uploads once a day. So this is about six days of uploads. And over here is the number of videos that have already been sent to YouTube. You can see that I've had this running on my account for about five months. Over in the middle, it shows you a summary of what you have on and off on your account. And over at the bottom, you know, you see a status of your accounts, YouTube, TikTok, both are good for me. We're going to do a lot more. I'm doing Instagram next. I'm doing Facebook. I'm doing LinkedIn. I'm doing Twitter, all the good stuff. Let's go take a look at my videos. Over here, here you can see a list of the videos that have been scraped from my TikTok account, but nothing has been done with it yet. I have the six approved videos over here that are ready to go out. Every day, one of these videos will go out to YouTube in chronological order, which is what you see here. You can also hide videos here and they show up in the hidden, you know, the ones that you don't care about. And then there's the ones that you have uploaded over in this tab. If you go back over to the dashboard and you hit the settings page, you can set a bunch of stuff here, you know, your overall publishing to YouTube and any other platform that I'm gonna add in the future the auto set I kind of talked about before, auto approvals, and then just some stuff you want to do with your video titles once it's scraped. And then also what you want to add to your YouTube description once it's been uploaded to YouTube. That's pretty much it. It's a very simple app. So hopefully people find it very easy to use. It does one thing and one thing really well. And that is to take your TikTok videos and publish it over to YouTube. So how do we get here? I got two architectures that we iterated upon. The initial design where we followed all the carefully scoped out requirements and constraints, the ones that we laid out in the previous videos where we did our research, simplified things, created a game plan and generally made things sane enough so that we could ensure a successful delivery. And then we got today's design where we threw all that out the window and did everything that every engineer fears and that is add an insane amount of scope and kept the deadline the same. Okay, I, I did the initial design, I did implement it and you know, then I rewarded myself with more work. 
uh, and more requirements because I wanted to make it a platform. Anyway, this is the MVP system. Here's how the proof of concept architecture looked like in the Ader demo table that you just saw. Super simple, we're gonna get into all the details of all the components in a bit, but before we dive into the technical stuff, we are emulating a real world situation here. And in a real world situation, we have business requirements. We have one single business requirement that made everything super hard. And that is this system needs to be 100% free, zero dollars. And I don't mean you got like one year of free from AWS or you got some sign up credit somewhere else and it'll run out over time. The whole system needs to be free forever. So what are the free components that we can use? Coming in at number one, our workhorse AWS Lambda. Or if you hate yourself, you can use the GCP or Azure or Oracle counterparts. We're talking about 1 million invocations and 400K GB seconds of compute per month free with some caveats of course on uh, runtime limits memory constraints and package upload sizes which will be important but i'll get into that later lambda is highly available highly redundant highly distributed and highly scalable forget 500 videos that i have on my account even at 5,000, even at 50,000 scrape jobs scraping videos we're going to be able to handle it concurrently now, this is really important because it does leave us enough room for flexibility to extend to multiple users. Of course, there are downsides to Lambda, but for our specific use case, it should be okay. Next, we got our data storage, DynamoDB. With Dynamo's free tier, you get 25 gigabytes of data storage, 25 write capacity units, and 25 read capacity units per month. AWS does not make this easy to understand, but you can think of one capacity unit as one guaranteed operation per second up to a kilobyte with a burst bucket of around 300 seconds I have written here. So in conclusion for this proof of concept, it's free. Now keep in mind, this is also the provision case. It gets a little bit more complicated with the on-demand case where you don't specify how many capacity units you want. Uh, but once again, for our purposes here, more than enough. Next, we have our Messenger and Job Manager, SNS and SQS, both of which have 1 million requests per month. Nothing complex about these services. SNS is just a notification service. We're pretty much only going to use its base functionality to trigger a bunch of stuff. And SQS is a message queue just like any other. It has retry logic out of the box. So if you publish something and it fails, uh, it'll automatically retry. And if it fails too many times, then you can set it up to automatically go to another pipeline for error handling. Now, SQS does have one caveat for our system though, and that caveat is that you can only have one for this entire system. If you have more than one, it will no longer be free. I will get into this into detail later on, but for now, just take note of it. And last but not least, we have our wonderful time scheduler and timekeeper, CloudWatch events. They don't give you too much information about this because there's a bunch of smaller services that make up the one CloudWatch service. Uh, but you know, take it from me, it's free. Quick note about this, I'm saying free a lot. You can definitely make these services cost money, but for the way that we're using it and how we're gonna handle our constraints, it's gonna be free. So for this specific instance, it's gonna be free. Don't just go crazy on AWS because you can definitely rack up a high bill. like. Make sure you know what you're doing, okay? Now that we know all the building blocks, let's see how we can piece them all together. We're gonna start off over here on the top left where the schedulers are implemented with CloudWatch events. What this is gonna do is that it's gonna trigger two Lambda functions which will equate to our scraper pipeline and our published job pipeline. In the scraper pipeline specifically, we are going to scrape TikTok videos once every 30 minutes. This will be configurable, but basically we're choosing 30 minutes because the target audience, me, can bang out maybe two or three videos in that time. Before we try to change this 30 minute frequency, what should probably happen is that we should look at the TikTok and see what kind of anti-abuse mechanisms they have and then choose a number afterwards. But before then, I think 30 minutes is a good amount of time to start off. Quick tip, when you're just starting off and you're building from scratch and you wanna iterate, it's always better to start off with a best effort guesstimate. 
and then try to get as much feedback as possible and refine based off of that. If you try to look for the right solution right off the bat, you're going to use a lot of time and effort and it's just not a good use of your time and it's not efficient at all. The second scheduler over here is going to trigger off the published pipeline. This schedule is going to happen much, much less frequently. It's going to happen once per day. Once again, this is based off of my own usage. So for the purposes of this POC, it's fine. However, if we want to extend this to multiple users, we're going to have to find a different way to handle daytime scheduling. Either that or try to find another timing mechanism that uploads to different social platforms. Now, quick tip again on the production system today, we already have a simple solution. This solution is to allow the user to enable a set settings so that the moment we scrape their video, it gets published directly to YouTube. Which means what we're doing is that we're deferring the scheduling to the user or another automation platform that they might be using. The key lesson here is that it doesn't always have to be an engineering solution. If you know your product domain or your business vertical, you can simplify engineering quite a bit with the correct product decisions. Let's talk about the scraping pipeline. When the scheduler kicks off, this Lambda function is going to run. It's gonna start up a headless browser, which will then go over to TikTok, use a signer validation method to create a signed URL, and then use that signed URL to grab the user's videos. Once it gets those videos, it'll normalize and sanitize the data, and then it'll store it into DynamoDB. It'll then go over to that headless browser instance where it'll then go over to a third party TikTok downloader website where it will get the download URL, you know, once again, saving it to the database. There's no fallback mechanism. If Lambda fails, we are consciously making that decision. The reason for this is that if it fails, it'll just run again in 30 minutes. So there's really no point over engineering for any failure cases in a POC. Although what I will say that in a production grade system, what I would do is I would probably put up some monitoring and alert system to let me know when the jobs have failed too many times. I might also put back some sort of fallback scraping mechanism, maybe go to a different downloader website or, you know, maybe use the official API. I don't know. If I ever go into the production grade system, that's what we'll talk about. Some limitations to Lambdas that we got to talk about. You're only allowed a 50 megabyte direct upload to the Lambda platform. For anyone using Lambda layers, the total is 250 megabytes uncompressed across all your layers and your main Lambda function. This actually makes things pretty hard because if you want to bundle a browser with your Lambda function, it's definitely going to go over 50 megabytes. And you might be thinking, those of you who are used to Lambda, you can say that you can use Docker images with Lambda now, which allows you to go up to like 10 gigabytes or something. But to use Docker containers with Lambda, you need to use AWS ECR and there's no free tier for that. Remember, we have to stick to our business constraint, which is everything has to be free. Fortunately, we can upload to S3 and then uncompress it to a Lambda layer. You can then automate the deletion of the files on S3 afterwards. And because AWS to AWS traffic is free, this whole thing is kept essentially free. You know, now that I think of it, you can probably do the same thing with ECR, although I haven't looked too deeply into it, but you know, maybe if I do, I'll make another video on it. The other thing to note here is that we are keeping the third-party downloader in the specific function. The reason for this is that we wanna keep the messiness of handling this browser instance upload problem in one particular function and not have it dilute the other functions we might have in our system. The more modular solution would be to pull the TikTok downloading job into something down the pipeline maybe right before the download and publish job. So in this case, we're making the trade-off between maintainability and scalability, but we do have a game plan to improve the system once we figure out the package upload automation. Let's jump over to the publish pipeline. Much like the scraping pipeline, it starts off with the scheduler. This time around though, it does trigger only once per day. Once again, that is my own usage behavior. This will trigger a Lambda function, which will grab data from my user, do some assessments to see if I'm qualified for a published job, and then send that job over to SQS. Now, the assessment here isn't to check to see if my videos are there to be published or not. We want that responsibility to be isolated over to the published job. The reason for this is to have a separation of concerns between the pre-situational assessments like billing or account standing to post-situational assessments like how many videos I have approved or if I've already uploaded a bunch of videos for the day. You know, in case we wanna add something like quota limits. And, and to be honest, this is a bit of engineering for the future. Anytime I have to deal with one user, I usually design that particular piece of the system to deal with multiple. And actually in the production system already, I didn't have to change this job at all. I just 
added new users and it just worked. The trade-off here is that you're using more Lambda invocations and likely more DynamoDB calls because every single job is isolated and it has to, you know, get the request and get the data itself. We're okay with this trade-off because we want the separation of concerns to help with maintainability, modularity, and scaling instead of optimizing for traffic or system performance, which, you know, to be honest, a lot of engineers would prioritize. A lot of engineers who aren't looking at the overall picture, especially, you know, the product requirements. For anyone that's still watching right now, I can't stress this enough. Keep your system and your architecture as simple as possible. The more fancy things that you put into your system, the more pieces that are likely to fail. The scheduler timing here is important to note because the frequency is so low once per day, we actually need to have some sort of error handling or fallback mechanism. This is where SQLs actually come strong out of the box. Remember before where I said you can only have one SQS per system? I did a bit of digging and it turns out that using SQS as an event source to trigger Lambda functions doesn't actually use a push mechanism from SQS. It uses a pulling mechanism from Lambda to SQS. There are no additional charges for this feature, but because the Lambda service is continuously long pulling the SQS queue, the account will be charged for those API calls at the standard. Basically, the lowest frequency you have for Lambda to pull SQS to see if there's a job available is 20 seconds. Did the calculations, this turns out to be three per minute and around 129,600 requests Per month. And to make matters worse, the minimum number of parallel long pulling connections you can have for this is five, which means if you actually do the math, this turns out to be 648,000 requests per month out of the 1 million you have in your free tier. And this is why you can only have one free SQS component in any system. You go over this, it costs you money. You have been warned. So if we can only have one, it makes sense that it needs to be in the most important spot, which if we look at the critical path here, it has to be the upload job. The mission critical aspect of the upload makes it the most important part of this whole system. With SQS, you can set failure handling out of the box so that if the job fails, SQS can reinsert that job right back into the queue. This can be set to retry a couple of times until it finally fails permanently and either gets discarded or you can set a dead letter queue for that message to be retained there for later processing. For this, you can either have another Lambda function that does whatever to it, or you can set some sort of alert to tell you how many failed jobs there are in there so you can go manually deal with it. We don't actually have this in this POC architecture because it's gonna cost extra money. For the production system though, we do because we have more than just the user which is ourself, which makes sense because it needs to let us know when something failed so we can go and fix it. Moving on to the publish and upload job, pretty simple, this function will take the video URL that we got from the third party downloader when we did our scrape job, download the video into a buffer and directly upload it to YouTube using their API. Uh, let me tell you, let me tell you, uh, getting the API to work is super easy, but getting verified and approved for your app so you don't look like some third party scammer, that was hard, but we got approved and we're verified. So definitely go over to Creator Simple com where we did all the hard work so you don't have to. Once again, if the upload job fails, it goes back into the previous SQS job queue for a couple of retries until it gets permanently discarded. Once the job is done, any new data like the YouTube URL gets saved over to DynamoDB. Nothing special to know for this one. The caveats are pretty much handled before you get here. The key takeaway here is that you want everything as clean and simple as possible before you get to the most mission critical component of your system. I guess the one thing I can say is that the third party URL that we scraped before might expire. I did some tests on SnapTick and it looked like it doesn't, but I wouldn't say this is guaranteed forever. So we might actually want to refactor this architecture and move that job into its own isolated Lambda function and maybe put that right before this upload job. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this POC architecture. I'm not entirely sure if I want to spend the time making videos about the implementation or about the production platform architecture. It's pretty much more or less the same thing. So if you understand what I'm doing here, you can easily just copy and paste a couple of these components and make a production system. I don't know, let me know in the comments if you want me to do some videos on that stuff. If this video gets enough traction or again enough comments, then maybe I'll do some follow-ups. Or if you have any other ideas for me to build, definitely let me know in the comments and I'll try to take a crack at it. I hope everyone who has followed along with this project has learned how to go from idea 
to reality. That was the whole point of starting this entire project. And now I have a production platform. If anything, I hope the one lesson you take from this entire video series is that it's not really hard to do. You just have to take action. Once you take action, you're able to learn along the way, iterate on your ideas and make things better. That's it. If you like these videos, give me a like and subscribe. It'll really help me out with the YouTube algorithm to help me make more videos and reach a wider audience. I definitely have a lot of video ideas planned out. I just had to get all this done before I jumped over to that. All right. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Remember, always be building.